I know when a lot of us think about purpose, we often default to spirituality for our answers. So Johnny and I were both really fascinated around your delve into the science behind purpose. We'd love to hear a little bit of the backstory of how this book came together for you. Yeah. Um, so this book, I wrote this basically out of because of an ex- existential crisis I had when I was a, a medical student. I was studying, I went to medical school in Baltimore at, at Johns Hopkins and for whatever reason, at this time in my life, I was really troubled with the implications of science, in particular the theory of evolution, that seemed to be, from my perception at least, in conflict with the sense that I had, that, that most of us have, that life has value and meaning and purpose. And I laugh about it now. I remember a particular quote from a professor many, many decades ago in the mid 20th century who wrote, in the inevitable march of evolution, life is of profound unimportance, a mere eddy in the primeval slime. And that just kind of, you know, it's like, oh, <laughs> it, nothing matters. Oh, you know, um, terrible. That, that, that is this really what biology and science broad, more broadly implies about, you know, human nature and, and our existence? Well, I know in my studying of evolution in undergrad, uh, a lot of it was centered around the randomness. And I think for many who look at and think about evolution, it does feel random, purposeless, uh, and up to chance. And you argue that actually there's a lot of science behind the fact that it's not as random as many of us think. What is going on in evolution that would point us in the direction that maybe there is a higher order? That's a great point because that was something that was kind of like, you know, are we really just, you know, tens of thousands of intricate molecular accidents that, that, that somehow came together? And there's there's lots of good data and arguments these days that that's not necessarily the case. A lot of this work. Probably more than any other person, this is the work of a, a biologist named Simon Conway Morris. He is at the University of Cambridge, and he has noticed patterns throughout nature that uh, many creatures develop the same things independently over and over and over and over again. So maybe just take a couple examples. So birds, bats, and butterflies, they all have wings and the capacity for flight. But biologists tell us that through the long course of evolution, you know, they're their most common recent ancestor did not have flight or or wings, and and so they each independently developed this uh, this ability. You know, as another example, when you look at a shark and you look at a dolphin, they look really really similar. And and you know, someone who doesn't have any knowledge of biology would think, oh, they probably you know they're very closely related. Well, that's not the case. A, a, a dolphin is a mammal. Uh, it has a skeleton of bone. A shark is a fish. It has a skeleton of cartilage and you know, a dolphin, they think that, that they, the ancestors of dolphins were, were land-dwelling and somehow migrated back into the water, but they each kind of have this body shape that is, you know, extremely similar. You know, another example is eyes. You know, we all have, we have eyes and, and the estimate from biologists is that eyes have evolved independently about 40 different times. So, you know, you get the sense that there is a pattern here and it's not just kind of one thing after another, but that there are these principles, these higher order principles that are constraining evolution to you know, go in certain ways and and not others. And with that conclusion, so looking at it <laughs> as not, not random, how do we draw that back to human purpose? Because I think for many of us, it feels currently that science is almost pitted against religion. And for some, science has become a bit of a religion. And I'm curious how you now, taking this view and evolving yourself around the viewpoint of evolution, how you can take that and bring it to me and Johnny sitting here and finding our own purpose. Yeah, yeah. So that's one part of the equation, okay? That, that, there were two major things uh, about evolution that bothered me. One was the randomness piece. And I'll totally, you know, to be intellectually honest, just that, just saying it's not random doesn't necessarily cut it to, to say right. that. By the way, this, you know, Richard Dawkins, who's probably our generation's most outspoken atheist, would agree with this. And in fact, he kind of proved this point when he asked one of his colleagues, he said, can you think of anything that has evolved only once? And his friend could only think of a handful of times. So, so what I'm saying so far has, is not in any way go against, you know, what is pretty much mainstream thinking in evolutionary biology. 
But that doesn't, again, prove, okay, you know, we have some purpose. It, it could just be, you know, the cold and different universe that has laws. So to kind of continue a search for, is there actually an overarching purpose and meaning to our existence? We got to turn to human nature. And, and this relates to another part of what I thought, at least before I really delved into the, the details, this was another part of evolution that was kind of like, ugh, this doesn't seem right to me. And it had to do with what it implies about human nature. Charles Darwin published his most influential book, The Origin of Species, in 1859. A couple years later, another biologist coined this phrase, survival of the fittest, right? Probably everyone's heard of it. And biologists don't tend to use that term too much today, but it, it, it is somewhat instructive and it also kind of gets to this sense that a lot of people who don't have much training or, or understand this, that they think, okay, evolution implies that we're selfish, that we're, you know, aggressive and greedy and so forth. And if that's true, that's kind of a pretty depressing view of human nature and a bitter pill to swallow. Going back to, to, to Richard Dawkins, sorry, not, not to pick on him too much, but, you know, probably his most famous book is called The Selfish Gene. And, and the, most of the book is not necessarily about selfish behavior, but it's an interesting title. But in the first pages of that book, he, he says something to the effect that, look, if you're trying to build a good society, uh, one in which people interact and cooperate, you're not going to get any help from biology because we are born selfish. Okay. It turns out that it's more complicated than that. And I think anyone who observes human nature recognizes well, people aren't just selfish. They also have a capacity to interact in ways that are really altruistic, you know, selfless. And nature seems to have shaped us in ways in which we have both capacities. We have a deep capacity for selfishness, but also altruism. And, you know, this seems to be a, a cruel kind of twist of fate. And, and this is one of the reasons that life is such a, a struggle because we, in, in, in a very real way, we are kind of pulled in different directions. So if we look at other animals, where does altruism come into play? I think a lot of us view other animals as entirely selfish and survival of the fittest, but humans seem to have been evolving in a direction where altruism is actually rewarded as we're in tight-knit close communities and our population has continued to grow. You particularly see this in families, but also there, there's a whole group of animals that are, that are sometimes called eusocial. These are things like ants and bees. They behave in incredibly cooperative ways. You know, we kind of rival them with our level of cooperation. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it's just humans because there's lots of examples from the natural world uh, where, where, you know, creatures interact in, in ways that are altruistic. It's, it's not totally unique to humans. You're kind of, you're, you're putting your finger on this debate that has, has gone on about, you know, are we just advanced animals or are we different? You know, I, I think it's a bit of a false dichotomy because, yes, we are different in, in our abilities, in, in, in degrees. But if you differ so much in a degree, it's a totally different thing, right? I, I think it's a little bit of a, a silly debate to take because clearly we're very different than animals. You know, no other animal can, you know, make cell phones or, or send a creature to the moon or perform heart surgery. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of shared characteristics that, that we have. So hopefully I've, I've, I've answered your question a little bit. Yeah, I, I am interested to know how you view those, the duality of those two forces. And there's a, a few examples of this in the book that you give, not just altruism and, and selfishness. Yeah. But certainly if we think about some of our family or friends or colleagues, we can definitely identify the selfish and we can definitely identify the altruistic. So how do we split the difference and what might be going on there in terms of our decision making? Yeah, well, what I think is I think that we all have capacities of each within us and that there are certain frameworks that are going to help us to, to bring out one versus the other. There's a, a psychologist, uh, Jonathan Haidt, you may have heard of him. He, he's, he writes a lot. He's, he's got a wonderful metaphor that I think is really um, instructive to this. So he, he has this metaphor that he calls of the, the rider and the elephant. Okay. And that's how he describes human nature that, you know, we, we do have control, uh, but we're kind of like our, the deliberate part of our, our decision-making process is like this person who's riding an elephant. And as long as the elephant doesn't, you know, have a, a desire of, 
of his own, we can tell the elephant which way to go. But if the elephant really wants to do something, we're kind of powerless to to pull it back and rein it in the other way. So I, I think this is a really good metaphor for human nature because there are certain contexts in which that altruism is more likely to flourish and in other contexts in which, you know, jealousy or, or selfishness or, or something else tends to, tends to predominate. And so identifying those contexts, uh, I think, is a, a really important kind of social goal and, and goal of, of social science. So free will is a, a hotly debated topic, but I, you know, at the same time, it's kind of, um, it's kind of at the root of, of what we see is, is human beings you know, intrinsically, the way we view each other, we see each other as, as free and autonomous beings. And there's something about it that is just seems to be fundamental. A lot of philosophers and scientists have wrestled with this issue for a long time. Uh, there was a, a scientist, fairly well-known scientist, Robert Sapolsky, who came out with a book in the fall of 2023, basically saying that, yeah, you know, free will is just an illusion, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I, you know, I, I take this head on and I think there's good data to suggest that, that he is not quite right. Um, I agree with him that there are lots of things that factor into the decisions that we make, but that doesn't mean that things are 100% determined beforehand, that this conversation that we're having right now is, is not inevitable. Uh, and it, it was not somehow pre-written or pre-ordained into the, the Big Bang. Um, so, uh, happy to dig into kind of what, what evidence suggests that the religious aspect of free will is certainly not determined either. Even within, uh, Christianity, there are those sects that believe that you're just going to live out God's plan. And then there are those in, uh, in certain sects of Christianity that are like, no, you do have free choice and free will and, uh, your actions are going to determine uh, your result. So even in the religious aspect, it, it's certainly not. Correct, correct. And, and I think what you're referring to probably dates back to John Calvin and this notion that, you know, whatever happens is God will. And, and how can God be all powerful if if we also have free choice and and that sort of thing? So I, I you know, th- this book, as, you, as you've noted, there, there's a there's a deep kind of religious implication to it. I mostly kind of shy away from delving into theology, but just like, you know, trying to appeal to the, the sense that most, most people have that life has value and meaning and so forth. And that there, you know, that there is some sort of higher, higher purpose or higher power. What the science says, or my interpretation of the science are, are, are two things. And, and when you talk about free will, inevitably you have to come up to, a kind of boring but necessary task of defining your terms. Uh, because when we talk about free will, some people mean one thing, some people mean another thing. Uh, for me, at least, it's it's kind of built into the term itself that the free part, that there are some actions that are not deterministically tied to the past. And there's some, some wiggle room in the cause and effect relationship that is so important to, you know, how we often view the world. Um, the other part is that the will part is that we can we can with our thoughts control our our behaviors and our actions. And I think there's 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 good good scientific evidence that that both of those propositions hold that behavior even at even in relatively simple organisms. Um, for instance, in, in one experiment, biologists have a a leech. And, they, and, and the leech can respond in one of two different ways to a stimulus. It can either swim or it can crawl. And they'll, you know, they'll set up the experiment to where the conditions are exactly the same, but they can't predict, is the leech going to swim or crawl? They'll do it. You know, it's kind of a probabilistic thing. And they'll say, well, you know, 60% of the time it'll do one thing, 40% it'll do another. They'll do experiments with other organisms like a worm or a cockroach, something like that. And there seems to be this unpredictability about it, that no matter what, if you, if you control the, the conditions exactly the same way, uh, even with the same organism, it will behave in different ways. And so, um, you know, as you get to humans, it becomes more and more complex. But my logic is that, look, if, if these simple organisms behave in ways that are, are fundamentally indeterministic, do we really think that humans 
are going to be fully deterministic. And I think that's kind of a, a relatively uh, you know, straightforward conclusion that, that, that we're not deterministic. I think we have to look at it in a, in a species aspect as well. I mean, time plays a role. I mean, when we look at it at an individual level, that is certainly different from a group level. And then from a group level to a civilizational level. And, and so who's to say, like, what aspects of free will are we going to measure? You're going to get different answers from an individual level to a group or civilizational level. So that makes it incredibly difficult because if you're going to argue one, I'm like, okay, well, let me argue on the individual level and show you why that doesn't, that doesn't work here. So again, that brings the disconnect and all the confusion of, okay, well, then we have to set and define what we're going to discuss and what that means, or we're not going to, we're not going to be able to agree on anything. You're right. You know, that, that behavioral tendencies can emerge at different levels. So if you're talking about the way a, a one organism behaves versus like a family or even a group or social, you know, larger social group of, of organisms, there, there's, there, there may be, you know, different patterns and, and principles that, that apply. So it's, it's a very complex uh, concept. It's a fascinating one. So looking back at this human nature and its role in, in purpose, um, there are a couple other examples that you give in the book of this duality. So we talked a little bit about selfishness and altruism, um, but one that comes up a lot, and certainly Johnny and I talk a little bit about dating in particular, is this idea of monogamy and promiscuity. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, we're seeing now a rise in secularism. We're seeing, uh, along with that, a rise in polyamory and and some alternatives to monogamy. And I'm curious how you view that duality when it comes to love and lust in humans, and how that might actually unlock purpose in us. Getting right to the heart of it, are we? You know, uh, <laughs> it's a it's a it's a dicey subject. It's obviously a subject of great interest to a lot of people, but there is this, you know, even to that level, the the way that we approach you know, using biological terms, reproduction and mating and so forth, um, it's, there, there's a, a sort of dichotomy. When you think about, you know, potential sexual partners, again, just to try to stick to maybe sterile biological language, most people, they, they have some desire and it, it's greater, it's more pronounced in men for, for reasons we can get into be, through, through evolutionary psychology, but, you know, have a desire for, you know, a variety, a diversity of partners. But there's also this, this expectation that, you know, we want commitment, right? And when you look at the data, there's this dichotomy and you can't really, from a societal level, you can't really uh, satisfy both simultaneously. And every person has to try to um, make, that, uh, make that decision of, as to, you know, kind of which, which way are they going to go. And as you've noted, you know, the topic of polyamory seems to be lots of different places in, in the news and the media. There are good reasons from evolutionary psychology and evolutionary biology that this is going to be a tricky road to go down. I think this is not a way that we want to go as a society for the benefit primarily of women um, because uh, this can lead to a, a lot of violence. A big factor in domestic violence is sexual jealousy. And, you know, there's there's this kind of inextricable link between between promiscuity and sexual jealousy that people might have experience with this when you have you 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 learn of an infidelity on the part of your spouse especially for men there is this almost in reflexive uh jealousy that arises and and this you know in many ways can be in, in some instances can even be uh you know lethal and and lead to violence so it's a it's a very tricky um, relationship that I think we just want to think about really critically as this discussion goes on about how relationships are are formed and and so forth. So Sam, with that point and the way that and the trajectory uh, that we're heading now culturally, where do you see that going? I don't know, but it, it, I mean, wh here's what I predict will happen if it becomes more and more. Uh, prevalent, you're going it, to, it's going to, right now, it, it tends to be 
not exclusively, but a lot of times these cultural trends happen among the most educated, among the, you know, the quote unquote elites, and then it might trickle down. And, you know, people with more, say, impulse control and so forth may be able to make it work at some level. But as this trickles down to people with less, ed less education, maybe less ability to control their impulses and so forth, I think there is going to be more domestic violence. Uh, I think there's going to be, you know, more gender inequality, right? If, if we're trying to, to move forward in, in gender inequality, I think this is going to be a, a bit of a step backwards. Uh, I think there's going to be maybe an expectation if it becomes more and more predominant, more prevalent, there's going to be an expectation on the part of men more than women that, hey, you know, let's, let's have a, an open relationship. And, and that's, you know, I think that's going to be, it's going to be tricky. A key point you make in the book is that if we look across cultures, this pattern of monogamy is clear. So I know all of us are bringing a cultural context to this conversation. And that cultural context could be religious influence based on the way we are raised, the communities we're a part of. You mentioned another culture, the elites. But I just want to point out that what is clear in the science is this pattern of monogamy in humans is prevalent across all cultures. Religion builds morality upon monogamy and the nuclear family in a lot of different instances of different religions completely. So there is a signal that is present in human nature that science is measuring across all of these cultures that leads to this conclusion of monogamy. Yeah, I, I think it's one of our great social achievements as a, as a human race. You know, biologists tell us that, that our closest and our closest relatives biologically are, are chimpanzees and, and chimpanzees have basically they, they, they have sex indiscriminately. And, and so sometimes people point to that and say, well, you know, we're, we're just kind of like more advanced chimpanzees. One of the, one of the things that we don't, we often don't recognize how good we have it as human beings. Do, do either of you have just to guess if we applied our notion of say domestic violence, to chimpanzees, do you have any, any estimate or guess at what proportion of female chimpanzees at some point in their lives experience what we would frame as domestic violence? Uh, nearly 100. Yeah, yeah, 100%, 100%. And, and, you know, I would say that those, those are linked. Um, and, you know, a lot of times violence is used by males to control, uh, you know, reproduction and, and reproductive access and so forth. And, and you know, again, I, I totally agree with you, AJ, that we, we, ha we do have a deep capacity for, for monogamy and, and what, you know, anthropologists would call long-term pair bonding. Um, we also have a capacity to not to kind of disregard that. I think it doesn't take long to look around the tabloids and see examples where, you know, people are behaving in, in, in other ways. It's obviously a sensitive issue. Um, I think it's going to be good for society. It's going to be good for children. It's, a, it's going to be good for women if we can continue on this uh, road, road toward monogamy. It's, you know, it, it's not easy, especially with some of the cultural changes that have happened in the last decades, at least in the West. But I think it's a, a fight worth, uh, worth continuing. And, you know, it's in, in a sense, it's, it requires us to overcome a, you know, a deep kind of propensity within, within human nature. To bring it home and, and to get back to this idea of, you know, what, what actually is the purpose of existence, it, to me, it seems that, look, the way that nature has shaped us leaves us pulled in these different directions, right? Um, you know, we have these differing capacities within us. Um, and when you combine this, again, my conclusion is that on some level, we have this ability to choose, uh, you know, free will. To me, it seems like life is a test, that, that we have to kind of choose between these competing impulses within us. And uh, it seems at least on, on some level that that, uh, that life is a test. You know, we've had on Dr. Robert Waldinger to talk about the Harvard Adult Developmental Study, and I know that's a key chapter in the book. So I'd love to segue into, you know, how does this look from purpose from a personal level, but then also what is this good for society level that is linked obviously into human nature? Because it's clear through all of this that we have thrived as humans in civilizations. It's not been on our own, completely isolated, and it's not been in small tribes trying to fight off woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. 
we've been able to survive and strengthen in forming civilizations. And a lot of this meaning and purpose is tied to the human nature around creating these civilizations. Yeah, and uh, and also at, at a fundamental level are our immediate social groups. And when you ask people what is most meaningful about life in these large surveys that say the Pew Foundation does, uh, and, and you, you give them a blank answer, so it's not necessarily multiple choice. They just can write whatever they want. Most people list in some form their personal relationships. And, uh, you know, I think that is, that is revealing. Um, as you, if you noted, you know, a lot of people will just say, well, should I just work as hard as I can, give as much money as I can? And we have, you know, there's some kind of cognitive illusions that, that, that nature kind of has in a sneaky way built within us because we're not good at, you know, one of the psychological principles that, that is really interesting is, is this notion of affective forecasting. Okay. And that, that is the ability to predict how we're going to feel in a given situation. Okay. Um, and, and what that means by extension is that we're not great at predicting what's going to make us happy. Let me qualify it a little bit because we're mostly good at predicting whether a situation is going to help us to feel like positive or negative emotions, but the intensity and the duration of those emotions we're, we're not great at. So, you know, this was, this was driven home by a, a, an influential study in the 1970s with the provocative title of lottery winners and accident victims, where, you know, researchers, they went and they assessed these two very different groups of people, ones that had suffered uh, terrible accidents that left them quadriplegic or paraplegic, and the other group, those who had, had won the lottery. This wasn't immediately after the, the uh, event of interest, but uh, some time. And so, you know, if, if I asked you, would you rather win the lottery or suffer an accident? You say, well, of course, I'm going to want to win the lottery because my happiness is going to be better, right? But the, in terms of the ability of these two different groups of people to enjoy everyday things, there wasn't really any difference. Um, and, and that is because, and well, you know, it's because of a related principle called hedonic adaptation. This notion that for a lot of things, you know, after a, a, a period of time, our kind of happiness set point goes back to where it was. And, and that's certainly the case with, you know, things like money, getting a promotion, that sort of thing is, is yeah, they make us feel better for a period, but then we kind of settle back in. In, in a way, there's a good part about this because we also, it also means that we can adjust in the other way. And that if we go through some adverse, you know, some sort of adversity that we can adapt and, and prove resilient and, and adjust to difficult circumstances. Um, so it's not all bad, but there is a kind of a maddening aspect to it that, that, depicts us almost as like hamsters running on this like happiness treadmill. Um, but the, the, the key exception is, is relationships and that, you know, again, for good and for bad, you know, a positive, warm, intimate relationship can really increase our happiness set point. Whereas a toxic one, you don't, you don't really adapt to that. Toxic relationships kind of have this enduring negative impact on, you know, well-being. No, it, it's a great point. And I think the, the inverse is also something that's fascinating to me. So we had Daniel Pink on the show to talk about regret. And many of us end-of-life situations feel intense regret on the singular pursuit of achievement that often leads us to grow distant from those relationships in our life, friends, family, loved ones. And even upon achieving that, that regret dampens us later in life when we recognize the value in those relationships. So it's happening on both ends. It's impacting our happiness, but it's also that pursuit of achievement is impacting our regret later. Yeah. Well, and it's also showing up in all the studies that we're seeing. We've talked about it on this show for a long time now, which is the loneliness epidemic. Yeah. And there are m multiple reasons uh, why we were going down that path and, and, and we need to correct that. And, and due to that, we have a sicker society. Uh, we have a, a mentally unclear in, in a society as well. And all these things are contributing to our, our culture. So what I'd love to unpack for our audience is the overlap of relationships and purpose. Because I think a lot of us, when we hear purpose, it does draw out individual viewpoints 
of, again, achievement, success, things that I need to do. It's something that we even sought to find that purpose. And in actuality, a big argument in the book is that purpose is found through relationships and through these social ties and connections. And then that has a great impact on society as a whole. There's certainly a, an aspect of human nature that there can be a, you know, a, a purpose in attaining individual recognition or status. And, and there is a measure of kind of satisfaction that can come from that. But it tends to be dwarfed by this sense of purpose and meaning that comes from I am part of a larger group. I am contributing to a cause that is greater than myself. And that's all about, you know, social cohesion and how we relate to each other. And that, you know, my impact is not just about me, but it's about you know, kind of the greater social good. So this just, again, it goes back to, to relationships. There's, you know, the one thing that I think is somewhat unique about the argument I'm trying to make is, right, where that comes from. In a, in a kind of biological evolutionary history. And a lot of it comes from, if we want to go down this path, if, if we don't, that's fine. But the way that our, you know, the, the way that our families are formed and the way that our offspring are so helpless when they are born. Yeah, I would love to unpack that. And I know we've touched on attachment theory on this show in the past with other guests, but I thought it was really unique to bring it into the conversation of purpose. Because I, I think it's a popular trending idea on social media, and a lot of people are aware of attachment, um, but I had never thought of it in, in the greater value of purpose. Yeah, I, I think they're related. So just to give a little context, you know, in the early 1900s in the fields of psychology, psychiatry, there was this sense that, you know, relationships were just a means to an end. The baby loved the mom because the mom gave the baby milk. The, 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 the husband loved the wife because the wife gave him sex. And, you know, the, the very sort of kind of transactional nature to it. Uh, one of my kind of academic heroes is this guy named John Bowlby, who was a psychiatrist, a British psychiatrist, and who really kind of gave rise to this, this attachment theory. And he worked with, uh, he worked on not only people who studied humans, but people who studied animals. And he recognized, you know, even in animals, relationships we're not just a means to an end that, that, that animals would engage in behaviors to strengthen relationships just for the purposes of strengthening relationships. And, and the way that he characterized this is it, 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 the root of this comes from the parent child attachment, right? When our, our, and our offspring are probably the most extreme example of this is that they are extremely helpless when they are born. So everything a human baby does, you know, cry, coo, uh, smile is meant to draw the parent to the child. And that, you know, Bowlby reason was adaptive. And, you know, it had to be like that because the infant was so helpless. You know, those who study infant development sometimes refer to the first, say, three to six months of life as the fourth trimester because our babies are born half baked. And so, you know, conversely, the hum the, the parent had to develop this deep kind of love and attachment towards the child. It's not just a one-way street here. You know, certainly the, the child looks out for, you know, the parent's uh, watchful care, but the parent, you know, anyone who's been a parent, <laughs> you're looking at your three-year-old, making sure they're not running in the street, that sort of thing. There's this, there's this kind of, like, they're a small attachment of you. And there's, a, there's kind of an evolutionary link to that, right? That, that some, becomes somewhat obvious, that, that, that strongest form of attachment and love and altruism and so forth comes from the way that, you know, the way that nature shaped our, our family relationships. Something I think is really interesting about that is that it's kind of inevitably linked with, with the challenge that is, right? If, if you ask a parent, you know, what is the most challenging thing you've done? Nine times out of 10, they'll say, raise my kid. If you say, okay, what's the most rewarding thing you've done? They'll say nine times out of 10, raise my kid, right? You, and you can't, you can't sign a, kind of get away from those. Let me, let me just, if it's all right, drive this point home with this a kind of kooky thought experiment. W imagine what our social lives would be like if we were, say, seahorses, okay? So seahorses are different. In the, they, they have male pregnancy, which would probably automatically lead to some very different parental leave policies. But it, it, also the ways they're different is that they have like 2,000 babies at once. Part of that that's different is that they don't have any investment in their kids once they're born. It's kind of like, okay, they leave the male womb and goodbye, good luck, you know, hope you don't get eaten. Um, 
please make me proud. You know, no, no human being knows exactly what it's like to be a seahorse, but it's a good bet that they don't really care, have the same deep love and concern for their, their children, their offspring that, that human parents do. And so kind of at this confluence of, of psychology and evolution, there, you know, this, this, there can't be this deep love without compelling sacrifice. It's almost like a, a cosmic near spiritual truth. Does that make sense? Yeah, and there's another aspect to that as well. And Sam, perhaps you uh, could cite the study. I, we've talked about it on this show, but there is a, a certain level of happiness that we're all able to achieve, and that's going to go up and down as things change and we get older and there's going to be those hurdles. But those who do have children have much higher uh, ends of happiness due to having that relationship but their overall quality of life isn't as high in happiness as the, the person without the child. And I, I laugh about this because, of course, when I was younger, I never thought about having children. And now that I'm, I'm older and there's certain aspects of that that I, I do wish that I would get to experience and, and perhaps I will. But, you, you know, but that, that shows exactly of that attachment and what that delivers in us in our quality of life yeah there, i mean there's a lot of studies about this and, and i think this is where it's kind of really important to try to parse out our terms right we use these things like happiness well-being um you know good emotion right so parenting is not like if, if you think of happiness as like reading a book on the <laughs> beach that that's not parenting. I, I, I have, yeah, I, I have five children that are 14 and under, you know, so I, you know, it's, it's a busy life. Um, it's, but you know, when you use terms like rewarding that, you know, that seems to kind of, uh, really get to this, this matter more. There's a, a great book. Uh, it was written by a woman named Jennifer senior 2014 or so. And I really like the title. It said, um, all joy and no fun, the paradox of modern parenting. And and the only qualm I have with that is the word modern, because as I've kind of laid out here, it's always been a challenge. It's kind of like evolutionarily written into our natures that raising children is going to take uh, a lot of sacrifice and effort. Those rewards of joy are that much greater yeah. and one yeah, that, yeah. that people yeah. without children are never going to be able to experience. Yeah. And I know from my friends who have recently had children that it does give a lot of purpose and meaning to their life and often leads to men investing more energy into providing into their career and also influencing this great society. And I know there's some great science around, in particular, dads and children. I'd love for you to unpack, extending beyond the good life, what the great society actually means with all of this purpose. I think as you guys have pointed out, uh, as episodes that I listened to in, in prep for, for talking with you today, you know, we, there's this sometimes illusion we have that I can be happy all the time or I can have positive emotion all the time. And that's just not how reality is, right? Uh, and so, you know, sometimes in our efforts to avoid a negative emotion, we will maybe avoid a, you know, a longer term greater payoff emotionally. And, and I think, you know, that you see that a little bit, right? The, the fertility rate has fallen quite a bit and now is, is hovering around, uh, I would say, well, 1.7, 1.8 children per woman. And that, and that's lower than if you ask women, how many, pe how many children would you like to have? It's almost like a full child more than it, than it actually is. So for lots of complicated reasons, we, you know, families have been having fewer children, women have been having fewer children in, in the West. And um, I, I think that's kind of related to this. So I am trying to draw back to, you know, biology and evolution, right? When you think of like, is there anything more evolutionary, evolutionarily motivating than providing for your offspring? And, and as you mentioned, AJ, that you have friends who, um, who have children, and it kind of makes them view work in a different way. It's not just about me now. It's like, okay, I got to take care of my kids, Right. And, and so when I go to work, it's imbued with a deeper sense of purpose uh, than it was when it was just like I'm trying to, you know, be carefree and, and a bachelor and, and so forth. So um, I, I think those, are, those, those principles are related. What I'd love to hear from you, looking back at the research and everything you did and putting together this book, what would your advice be for Sam sitting there in med school 
being leveled in evolution class around <laughs> this concept of purpose, because it's something that we hear a lot in our clients and especially our younger clients who are fresh out of college and looking to find that purpose and often hearing advice on shows like ours that you need purpose to find meaning in life and to ultimately create the good life for yourself. But that concept of actually finding it for yourself is challenging. And many in our audience would love a map. So what, what is your advice to Sam sitting in that med school class? Well, there's a tendency uh, among some in our, in our Western culture now, especially those who are really driven to sequence these major life milestones, right? I'm, I'm going to get through, in my case, it, you know, it was medical school. And then, you know, us doctors, we go to school like forever. And so after med school, there's residency and, and there's a tendency to try to sequence those things and say, you know, I am, you know, after I'm done with all my medical training, after I'm stable financially, then I can focus on relationships, maybe a family, that sort of thing. It's tricky to say, this is a, you know, a, this is an approach that's going to work for everyone. But I think sometimes it's it's better if you don't sequence them. If you, you know, if you look at, uh, okay, let's, let me focus. I, I don't have to focus exclusively on work or school right now. Let me also have time in the evenings where I can uh, try to develop longstanding personal relationships. I mean, hopefully, you know, with uh, a romantic partner. I know dating these days is a, is a tricky thing. I, I was fortunate to get married right before I started medical school. So, is some scholars who study marriage will refer to this as, you know, a capstone marriage. That's when you kind of go through the career and then you have a capstone of marriage or a cornerstone, meaning that you get married a little bit earlier. I'm not going to be so uh, presumptuous to say, you know, this is when people should ma be married, that sort of thing. But you don't need to put it off. And in some ways, I think it, it's better to think about it earlier and not to not to sequence these these events in our in our lives. Uh, certainly, if you wait to form deep personal relationships too long, you know, other opportunities might might pass by for you to to do this thing. That's what I wish I would have known when I was younger. Um, and 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 just to kind of you got to remind yourself, look, it's the relationships. And, you know, I'm uh, by by standards of Yale professors, I'm fairly religious. And I feel like that's one of the reasons that I. I go to religious services on a regular basis to remind me, look, it's a relationship, dummy. It's not your career. I mean, that's important, but you need to have a balance and a focus for this, right? In biology, there's a word for imbalance. It's cancer, right? When, when one cell, you know, becomes so dominant in the organism, it, it can overtake and, and starve the other tissues and, and parts of the body. So, you don't want work to become a cancer. I mean, our brains finish growing and developing uh, late 20s. 27, I believe, is, yep, is right one of there. the yeah. awesome ages. And part of that in getting married early is that those pathways, and there's a lot of imprinting left to do, and there's pathways that are being built. And if you're building those with your significant other and then a, and having a family together, those pathways – and uh, are are that much stronger, and the imprinting is that much stronger. And not to say that you can't build that relationship after twenty seven, but but your your brain is is fully developed, and it, we see it just in in making friends as you get older is more difficult. In fact, we help our clients do that because it is difficult, and there's a reason why. It is better. There's lots of reasons for a lot of people that it's going to be better to get married early, to have children early uh, for those specific biological reasons. Yeah. Yeah. And this religious principle of investing in your community, I think, is another very important part of this finding purpose. And I know we see it in a lot of our clients this lone wolf mindset that if I just self achieve and I reach ranks and degrees and status personally, then I can put that down and I can start to invest in relationships. When in actuality, it's investing in your community that creates those relationships that helps you elucidate that purpose for yourself. And much of this purpose is tied to being in service of others. 
which is why most modern religious philosophies, that is a cornerstone of it, is the community building aspect because it is so closely linked to purpose. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree with everything you just said. So I'd love to hear what in this research of this book was most surprising for you, especially because I feel you did such a great job of looking closely at the science, but having this religious grounding. And I know as I started the show with, you know, many in our audience might feel that they're almost at odds, that you're picking one side or the other. But in actuality, there is a lot of overlap in the science that you researched in this book and, and brought forward. I feel like what was most surprising for me was the strength of the research that links marriage with well-being and happiness. That was just something that, that blew me away. And, and part of it was because like, it, just, it was the opposite of what I was reading in the newspaper or kind of the prevailing sentiment from you know, cultural and opinion leaders that uh, you know, if you wanna if you wanna be happy, you need to be carefree and you know maximize your freedom, and that you know th that is certainly not what the data say. The data, you know, the probably the, the two most the two modifi modifiable factors that most impact mental health, well being, happiness you know, all together are are marriage and actually religious participation, and 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 a lot of that has to do with with relationships. Um, and, you know, and, and it's, you know, Facebook and social media, you know, th there can be blessings from them, but <laughs> there's a lack of depth in, in relationships that are formed in uh, social media context that, you know, things like marriage and community groups, religious participation, that, that the depth of those relationships is really much more gratifying than any sort of Facebook friendship that you come across. You know, a lot of people, it's probably been said, you know, social media is a little bit like uh, the junk food form of relationships. There's this, there's this aspect to it that tastes good, but it, it has essentially no lasting nutritional value. And, and part of that is because I think in part, you know, these things weren't around when, when our ancestors were evolving. They didn't, you know, they're, they're, a, they're an imitation for, for social interaction uh, that, that we are, that our, you know, our ancient brains are, we're accustomed to and, and essentially, you know, evolved for. I have to remind people that this is an, this is an experiment. We don't know what the results are of all this technology. And, and even look, uh, it's been very difficult to talk about some of these things and, and certainly a very difficult book to write in today's climate with all of this. Um, yeah. because, because it does make things difficult. And a lot of the paths that uh, this technology has put us on has been very anti-human or even anti-relationship at, at, at certain points. And that's, that's difficult. We, and we have to understand that and navigate that. I mean, just for instance, there was a class action lawsuit dropped on um, dating apps last week due to them misleading the the public. But we're now 10 years into those marketing campaigns and we're seeing the results of how those marketing campaigns to get rid of the stigma of online dating and what they replaced it with uh, has resulted in. And we have to be able to fix that if we're going to be a healthy society. Yeah. One of the, I think one of the ways that we can approach this and so, you know, certainly there are benefits. I, I don't want to say, you know, I'm anti-technology, that sort of thing. You know, I, my, my, my extended family, my wife's extended family, we live across the U S we will have a zoom call once a month and the cousins can talk to each other. That's sort of, it's, it's a great, it's a great uh, benefit in that way. But one of the things I think we need to think about is we need to constantly be asking ourselves, how is this similar or how is this different to how, humans interacted, you know, anciently. And in the, in the ways that, that we can make it more like that, I think is going to make it better. So one of the things that uh, is, is pretty intuitive is that, you know, there's a lot of toxicity that exists on the internet. A lot of this has to do with anonymity, right? If, if you have a username that has no link to your personal identity, then there's, there's really no way that there's going to be any consequences for you saying all sorts of toxic stuff. People say things to each other on the internet that they would never say to each other in person. And, and that's because, you know, our subconsciousness 
kind of dehumanizes each other when when it's when we 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 don't see each other's faces and so forth it we we subconsciously forget that you know behind this chat is an actual person and so if we can you know can we make a policy where you know whatever social media platform is you have to have a picture and it has to be prominent and it has to be linked to who you actually are that would it's not going to solve all the problems but in in a subtle way is going to decrease that that toxicity that, that sometimes happens yeah, I, I think our our view on it is technology should be additive to your life. It should be additive to your community. It should be additive to your relationships. The fear that we have, and there's a recent article in Atlantic about this loneliness epidemic, is it's substituting mm-hmm. the third place, the religious gathering, the entertainment that we also gained from those weekly sermons and from our pastor and our religious leaders is now been completely substituted in our life by the screen. And that screen is readily available 24 seven. Whereas we only had that opportunity on Saturdays or Sundays to get together with our community in a safe space to build and foster relationships, be entertained by our religious leaders, and then come away with that village that helps support us in child rearing. And as we've become more and more isolated in our career, moving away from our friends and family, and that screen is ever present, that technology acting as a substitute, as we're seeing, has a cascade of negative impacts on our lives. And it does bring us further away when substituting from finding our purpose. Yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. So with this book, I'd love for audience to find out more about you and and where they can purchase this book as it comes out a little bit later uh, next month. Sounds great. Uh, You can visit my personal website, samueltwilkinson.com. Uh, you can also look me up on the on the Yale webpage. The book is available wherever uh, books are generally sold. Thank you for joining us, Sam. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Sam. Thanks very much for having me.